Hi there, my name is Katrina Farrako and I am the events coordinator for the Toadstool Bookshops in Keene, Peterborough and Nashua, New Hampshire. I am delighted this evening to present a digital poetry reading featuring and celebrating the works of Stella Hayes, to celebrate her new collection, One Strange Country, and uh, the work of Gary Light, to celebrate his book, Confluences. Um, this evening, I would like to introduce poet and our moderator. Um, Stella Hayes grew up in an agricultural town outside of Kiev, Ukraine, and outside of Los Angeles. Uh, Hayes earned a creative writing degree at the University of Southern California, and her work has been nominated for Best of the Net. Uh, her poems have appeared in Prelude, The Recluse, The Lake, Spill Away, other publications as well. Uh, and she lives with her family in um, the Northeast United States. One Strange Country is her debut collection of poetry, and we're very, very excited to host this event to celebrate it. Um, Gary Light has, has been published widely in literary journals uh, and poetry anthologies, not just here in the United States, but also in Canada, Israel, Europe, and the Ukraine. He's a member of the American Pen Center and the Writers Union of Ukraine, and his book, The Return Trajectories, was awarded the Ukrainian Writers Union's Literary Prize for the best collection of original poetry, poetry, excuse me, published that year. Congratulations. <laughs> and in early 2020, uh, his first English language poetry collection was published in Chicago. And that is this little beautiful book right here, Confluences. Um, he regularly participates in poetry readings and events on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, this evening's reading is going to be moderated by writer and translator, Matt Solomon. Salomon, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, he spends his creative time working on writing, photography, and music projects, and he's presented his poems and translations in a variety of venues in the Washington, D.C. area, as well as internet readings. And in 2007, Salomon completed a volume of poetry and prose called Return to the City of Hyphens, and he's currently working on a number of projects, including an original cycle of persona poems in two languages. Um, just a quick note before I turn this over to uh, Matt, I just ask that if you have questions or comments or things that you want to ask the poets, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll put a little message in there in a minute. Ask as it comes to you. Uh, there will be a portion for Q&A and discussion uh, about halfway, three quarters of the way through. Um, and I promise I will get to everything there. I just also ask that you keep your cameras and your microphones off. Um, one Strange Country and Confluences are both available at all three Toadstool bookshops. Uh, so Keene, Peterborough, Nashua, come by and visit us. We're all open um, or online at toadbooks.com. And we will mail it right to your house. You don't even have to leave the living room. It's great. <laughs> the wonders of the 21st century. Um, so I am going to turn this over to Matt. Thank you very much, Katrina. And hello, everybody. Welcome to all of you who are in attendance who are coming into the uh, Zoom room for, uh, tonight for the readings by Stella Hayes and Gary Light from their debut collections of English poems. Thank you all for being here. Uh, first, thank you also uh, Katrina and Toadstool Bookshops who've been in New Hampshire for I think uh, nearly 30 years or over. Um, imagine 30 years ago that browsing the bookshop meant something very different than it does today. And through all the changes, the independents like Toadstool uh, have been challenged by the new tech environment, even more so with the uh, COVID lockdown and all we're facing. Uh, so we, the writers and readers who depend on the independents share in their commitment to enabling access to a wider range of literature, more eclectic types of literature and poetry than you might find in the behemoth uh, impersonal browser. So if you don't already have Stella's or Gary's books uh, and would like to as a result and can visit uh, toadbooks.com, www.toadbooks.com and show them love. Additionally, I already have the books. I may need another set after tonight, but um, the, um, they also have a very nice art and literature collection, um, very interesting. So I'll be returning there myself. Okay. Uh, of course, measure of thanks. We thank the authors of tonight's featured works, One Strange Country and Confluences. Both were published, as Katrina said, in 2020. And while they are debut volumes in English, um, there's something of the debut adjective that um, doesn't 
really is some of what we usually think of when we hear it that doesn't really apply here. And I'll, I'll mention that at the start, we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, I would say, first of all, the works, the artistry brought to their works by Stella and Gary uh, is quite mature in every sense. The poems are informed by lived experience. The poems are accomplished and their effects on us, in us, are earned. These are accomplished works. Also, uh, what happens rarely in uh, debut collections that I've experienced, it happens sometimes, but very rarely, within each of the volumes the collection is presenting here tonight, the poems within cohere across and within the poems, but also across the poems. And this often happens very intensely. This lends uh, to each of the collections a kind of um, internal endurance. They're wanting to be not only read and reread, but reread in different ways. So we congratulate the poets and we prepare ourselves for quite, a, quite, quite an evening. The last thing uh, I will get to is kind of a little bit, uh, the Katrina's touched on it already, a little bit about the format of the evening. Um, basically the poets have decided to break the reading into three parts. In the first section, each of the poets will present two or three selections from their work. They've selected the poems there in this first section to be representative of the respective collection, a kind of announcement. It's as if the poems in the collections got together and elected representatives with no election fraud. And um, so that's kind of the announcement, the emergence here. The second section we are reading proper, I'll introduce the section, I'll introduce the poets, and then we'll go right to the poems um, near the end, and they'll read serially for Stella and Gary. And then um, at the end, uh, Stella and Gary will switch to a paired format in which Stella reads a poem in Russian, uh, in English, sorry, and Gary reads a corresponding poem uh, in Russian, either a translation or a, a poem close to the one that uh, Stella has read. Then we get into the conversational section that uh, Katrina already alluded to. This is really for you. you. You can comment anytime on the chat line, as she said, and please do. Um, finally, we'll end the reading as we came in with poems. Each poet has selected one poem to read as a farewell to you this evening. All right, we're ready now. Relax, open yourselves to the poems of Stella Hayes and Gary Light. Okay, Stella, go. Stella, can't hear. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, dear friends, family. I see my in-laws, Carol and Phil are there and my son Finlay is there and my best friend Rima and of course my dearest friend, my childhood friend Gary Light. I'm so excited that he's here. And Matt, thank you so much. And there's my niece Alessa, yay! <laughs> this is great. Um, this is a, a, indeed an intimate uh, salon-like evening. This, this is wonderful. We are celebrating poetry and celebrating each other and each other's work. So I'll go, I'll begin. The first one I'm going to be reading from my collection, What Strange Country is Called, An Euclidean Order. A Euclidean Order. In each star, a generation lay on awake, holding down to atoms, still unborn. The tireless planets held close in the embrace of that which is, all matter lay undying, swirling in reticent rings, in repudiation of now, recasting the earth Light once again. The second poem is called Monolith. And it goes like this. I am in a memory in the generation I lived among you. I stand against a world that has no use for paper. The printing press has outlived its usefulness. I'm allowed to read the dictionary in a language I don't have any use for one liking a cover, left in a recycling bin in a suburban alley. I look up words That's, that don't begin. They are suffixless. Our feudalism has evolved to an umpire. Those who descend are made to unlearn the alphabet by heart. Not seeing you 
and you, and you, is like not having any more paper resting on the desk. The lines, color in the lines, child plus plus, sorry, child plus child and a dog to love, a hole to fall into, a hole to fall through, again and again. Will you have children? Will they be like you? Like no one could possibly be again. Speaking in soft voices to my apparition, I promise to make my visit short. I transcend self-interest even here, where a bell undergoes a metamorphosis, where stone equals stone. I don't want to know. Please, someone, anyone, give me paper so I can see through your face. And uh, the third and last section in, it's the last poem in this section, section one, is called Day's Break. The, the day rose again, layers of the sun becoming instantly extinct. The white sheet that overnight divided me from you, the map setting the brain one syllabled synapse at a time, forming and reshaping a carbon footprint and possibly carbon making up the pieces of infinity. As some scientists claim, we return to carbon in red school ribbons. If I snap and it should bend apart, infinity plus the gift of today, you stepped as far as the lip of the golden bridge braid, gate, sorry, the golden gate bridge, ocean salt accumulating unbreaking skin. As it almost swayed like a dog's tongue lapping up the end of a day, you pleaded for us to make our way back to our day in San Francisco, broken in half, New York City left behind. An exile's life is planned one day at a time. With its lows and highs, we would return back in one column, slowly catching up with shadows already watchful, dropping off points of too many. You tell me on our drive up north, the jumpers are led. It spooks you, there is no turning back. A sun and a jumping off point peaking at noon, yielding to a moon, resting in exile. Heading it off to, to Gary Light. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, everybody. I uh, am very touched by, uh, by this evening. Uh, also, also sort of a pilgrimage to New England for me. This is where I've started my so-called American life. Um, in the state of Connecticut, which does have an ocean. And um, my first poem is dedicated to an ocean. Let the ocean behold the reflection of the heavens, then refute the misconceptions of it being soft and tender with Caesarea of Ora, or the sounds of Brasileira, be absolved now and forever of attempts on soul collecting as it's wedged into horizons as an optical illusion for those who gazed and wandered through the waters being mortal. It is not a panacea, nor is it a cleansing being, but it is rather an owner of all those repeated errors by those self-absorbed fanatics who were always so certain at the end appearing blind. Let the ocean behold the mundane understanding of nature and hope that it isn't vindictive. Um, in the foreword to Confluences, uh, there is a foreword that captures it pretty well, I think. Um, and it says that the book uh, is some sort of a homage to Leonard Cohen. Uh, Tatiana Retsev, uh, she is the publisher of the European edition of Confluences and she also wrote forward for both editions. So she noticed that Leonard Cohen, I quote him a lot and I use him in epigraphs. And this poem is one of those poems where Leonard Cohen is in the epigraph. So please allow me to um, read Leonard Cohen's lines first. You will undoubtedly recognize the song or the poem. 
And sometimes when the night is slow, you lose your grip and then you slip into a masterpiece. Leonard Cohen. A solo for the morning snow. All efforts to create in real time a masterpiece would definitely fail as inspiration does not get to become incarnate from Neverland. Yet there may be a single instance where such a premise may cast a doubt. And that is when the last exclamation of December floats by your window. A woman wakes, the mascara on her eyelashes remaining from last night, marking a semicircle of fate. The reflection of unearthly crystal flows would sparkle in the vain desires of eternity when evenings miraculously gray attempted to set the rules of the game. Yet all is otherwise in this sudden snowstorm. All along, the glance embraces a confluence of the water's edge with the sky as the white exquisite flakes appear only to turn into celestial numbers. The awakened woman wears nothing, and such heavenly garb is subtly befitting as her victory is merely a reflection of defeat, as in the case of the fallen snow and its reincarnation, not really fitting into words. Okay, I'm going to proceed to the next section and thank both poets for stirring readings and great selections. Uh, we'll return to these, I think, uh, later in the uh, discussion period, the conversational session. We're now moving to the main reading, um, in which I'll introduce the poets using the words of um, other poets uh, who are reacting to the works here. We'll begin with Stella, One Strange Country. And here's what a sampling of leading poets and reviewers have said about One Strange Country. Uh, Publishers Weekly had a uh, review shortly after um, uh, Stella's book was published. And from that we read, Hayes's restless and searching debut collection addresses the pain and disorientation of assimilation alongside the comforts of family. These poems jump between locations in Europe and the United States as if unable to stay put, to settle too long in any place. Meditations about Hayes's displaced family are emotionally resonant and insightful. This debut provides an honest and moving tribute to the immigrant experience. We'll next uh, draw from uh, several poets uh, who've commented, and we can, there's plenty of praise here from the poetic community. We'll get back to that maybe later. Poet Erica Wright um, is uh, uh, very concrete in her uh, review. At turns, gleeful and elegiac, grateful and defiant, one strange country considers the state of exile. The poet never shies away from her lonely mission guiding readers through landscapes both seen and unseen. And finally, from these reviews, um, this stirring one from poet Sa David St. John. There is a thread of loss, of homeland, of family, of innocence, weaving itself through Stella Hayes' exquisite and deeply compelling debut collection. With its restless reckonings and mature power, One Strange Country is a book to hold close and treasure. And um, we move ahead, uh, summing things up, restless searching and reckonings with the seen and unseen states of exile, approach with honesty and mature power. This is a book to be read, to be reread, and again, all the while to be held close. Stella Hayes. Stella, I'm afraid you're muted again.
Okay, sorry about that. I wanted to tell you, thank you, Matt, for conveying such wonderful words from the, the poets who wrote about, who commented on my book. I'm very humbled and I'm very happy to hear these words aloud. Um, so I will, I will go to the next poem in, in, our, in this section, the main reading. And this poem is called Closer to Rome. And this poem I wrote many years later after my mother and I shared an apartment, a communal apartment in, in, in a town in La Dispele, uh, outside of Rome, when we left uh, the ex-USSR, former USSR together. And so again, this is a poem called Closer to Rome. And my mother makes an appearance here. You taught me how to slay a chicken you would buy on the cheap from a supermarket in the Roman port city of Ostia. These weren't divided villas for the Roman condo experiment of the first century. We lived there in a shared breath with other immigrants waiting to be admitted. We waited, collecting each other's tears into the pages of unread books to forget the one who was left behind, waiting for his own death sentence at trial, more life to steal. In elementary school, you could not stop reading literature of high romanticism. In the dark blue of night, by a corded lamp, inside a mahogany wardrobe that took up much of the hallway outside your parents' bedroom. One of three rooms in post-war Soviet communal dormitory, with back leaning on a faded wall, I trace you reading and listening to your mother's footsteps approach, putting an end to near morning dreaming in your own ghost feather bed under unforgiving stairs, leading out, out to another cold winter, taking me away to my own footsteps in the snow not yet fallen. Walking through the underworld. Um, so my father makes an appearance um, in this poem. On my window, colored heads bound in swiftness in their decision to bring about movement and motion. The snow is taking a break from falling as it did just days before. The village is painted in primordial gray with roofs in color too happy even for a rainbow. Eavesdropping on a father being mourned at the mouth of the coroner's bed, the aroma of death, a father and daughter lost to loss his gravity. A walk through the underground would have to wait. His body wasn't friendly overnight, forgetting that it was capable of carriage, despite the force of gravity. Forgetting it was self-possessed, despite being broken down. Anyone it keeps bumping into when awake it made what sounded like a voice of pleasure, but as closely as I allowed myself to hear the bedtime fury, he was letting out what sounded like a body's pain, wrestling to bring itself respite, at least overnight, at least it should have been given a break, like in a fist fight for survival, the mercury line inside the thermometer rising and rising in cold flurries, the snow's motion resting, motionless, he in, inside a fury. I am with him, right hand on his forehead, as he is inside a breath, cataloging heat and cold, in hope of cooling, in hope of slipping free from the heat. I am crossing a field with banks of too much snow, the grieving child watching with her eyes, as she has seen so too much. You won't recognize me. I see a twin likeness in the, sh in the shadows under a thin light. We will be shadowless, skipping through somewhere, somewhere where we can't or won't want to be from. The Knowledge of Water. The Knowledge of Water, where is it? Page 13, okay. I draw a bath and wait for the porcelain to be made warm enough for me to step down 
February continues to be unbearable, pressing on me with a supernatural force. My body keeps betraying me. A boulder for a brain resting in a skull, my bruises in weightless with the water fall in and resurface like firewood. With you again underwater, without a face, the brain a boulder, I am filling up with you again. With almost new airflow, a silence settles on my skin as I lift myself out. And the last film in this section is called A Love Song. And again, my mother makes an appearance. One more night to dismantle like a toy train, another day to be folded up and put in a drawer, a continent to put out of sight, another moon to unfill, one more vowel to blot out from the page, another consonant to render useless, another veil to put over the eyes, a flurry of wood colonies buzzing like fruit flies in the ear, the tear duct at the ready the iris filling up, scenes of you play out. I long to close my eyes, know that you are not in the dark, that I am, that I have my, ha my hand in yours, that you have not rubbed me out with the pink eraser on the back of your pencil. On the page, my sentences formed more of vowels and consonants, hammer at closed scabs, formed along the way from child to adulthood. On closer look, they reveal what made them. The removal of childhood from Genesis in one strange country to the placement in another whose language is uninflected and dominated by consonants. My eyes are still closed. I see and supersedes. I see my mother in a handmade dress sorting through strawberries. I'm struck by her. We went in the shallow of the forest to forage for lilies of the valley, the aromas of forest and perfume in my hair, our apartment filled with her, the plaintive road ride on the pond filled with large water lilies. Do I dare to, do I dare the scenes of you to unplay, the brain to anchor to anything at all, the water lilies to harvest, the hair to unpin, the bat to unmake, to make a stranger of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as many of you noticed, the, um, that last really gorgeous poem is also the title, contains the title of uh, Stella's collection. Okay. Um, now I will introduce uh, Gary, and uh, he'll read through. Uh, here we go. I'll proceed in the same way, um, citing praise and synthesizing at the end. And there's been lots of praise for Gary's work as well, his first English uh, collection. Here's a sample. We'll start with uh, Leonard Lund. Well into his third decade as a poet, Gary Light uses his mature, vo his mature voice in confluences to translate multicultural images and locales. These are truly love poems and war songs crafted as universal encounters on those battlefields. Another prominent poet, one who we all happen to know, um, a poet and great artist, Nina Kosman writes, beautiful poems by Gary Light, who writes poems both in Russian and in English. These English poems by Gary have the same elegance as his Russian poems. And they are enriched by his multi-layered poly polyphonic use of the English language to express thoughts and feelings with sophistication and humor. Another prominent poet who actually is on the screen, Stella Hayes, who commented on Gary's work. Confluences features meditative streams of consciousness, prose poems in free verse, a deviation 
from Gary's strictly metered Russian poetry. These poems are like seascapes, or better yet, dreamscapes, sweeping the reader into a swirl. And finally, a um, different take on the same, slightly different take on the same phenomenon comes from uh, the poet Lia Chenyakova. Gary's works, words delicately embrace, tactfully envelop in fog, then dissolve into the twilight and easily relocate from the city on the lake to the city on the river, from childhood to adulthood, from reality to a dream and vice versa. Maturely conceived and executed layering, polyphony, meditative streams of consciousness and dream swirls, fluid dissolutions between the transparent, the opaque to the dark and back again into the light. One thing for sure with Gary's poems, you may or may not end up in the same locale where you began, but for sure you will not be the same. Gary Light. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very touched by that introduction and by all the kind words that very talented people have shared. Um, I, I will try to fit that horizon as much as I can tonight. Um, as I said, my first landing uh, in this amazing country of ours back in the 1980 was in New England, actually. Um, in the state of Connecticut. And um, I'm gonna read sort of a longer poem. Uh, it is called The New England Tale. And by no means do I mean disrespect for the state of Connecticut here. That's one note. Uh, another note is that I allowed myself to translate one line from a great uh, Russian poet, Andrei Vasilyevsky, with whom I had the privilege of uh, reading together a few times. Other than that, uh, I will just go for it, okay? A New England tale. It's the 90s recalled. Coffee, cigarettes, destiny doubts. In the handful of days, as, uh, as a break in pursuit of the present, When the winter is ready to exit, there suddenly comes a realm to consider simple essence, an evening, a flight, slightly turbulent landing, 95th center state in that state which is buried in snow and almost forgotten. On the right, sudden exit to that adolescent endeavor which had ended abruptly in a certain amalgam of trembling air, where New York is assumed to be near, and the memory comes of those sad collect call conversations on Saturday evenings, when the father and son have so little to say, to say while battling tears and being apart. Then New England became a harmonious prelude to that other England, the real one in Britain. As the two came together, in just a few years, which seemed to be consciously longer. As a fallen guitar, which was dropped from the bed, as she sighed out loud. And she did so piercingly, knowing the circumstances are such that this marriage is over. In that England, there were no continued safe premonitions of pairs. Even though they were in the depth of the several hours under the channel, I would never forget you, but won't insult you with mercy if I ever, by accident, see you. It just happens that way we become inexorably older. Once in the palindrome autumn, again wound up with a dream, was a dream of a woman. It was so insane that the crowd around decided it wasn't to be. It was a staged opposition we just sat in the car, taking in the surroundings, hurting each other with silence. It was mute while pain was swallowing. Simply establish the loss as it happened. When it snows in New England, it does so for real. 
and little walls of the snow abound, I'm suddenly feeling provincial. The one who is not scared of whiteouts as a child of snow, when that blizzard was crushing the roofs, is if a drunk and abandoned. I recall something else, that monster snow in 1977, it reflected in memory over the ocean. Those were the dear European beginnings in Kyiv. And again, an epigraph from Leonard Cohen, the odds are, are there to beat. Um, this uh, poem is about Holocaust, which uh, my family, well, part of my family survived and the other part did not. Uh, so there are two places which I'm mentioning. One is Babi Yar, which is a ravine um, in Kiev where the Nazis and their collaborators uh, slaughtered many thousands of Jews in just a um, matter of three days. And the other one is Selah's Fields, which is the same kind of sad fate only in Latvia. A brighter ray of sharp perceptions comes to life, comes from within, it's pondering and subtle. Such imperfection of the clouds feeds all strife. Subconscious childhood resurfaces to stutter. The year before Prague witnessed Russian tanks, apparent springs succumb to winter's echo. Our parents braved the cold, so many things. And we appeared to fill the void of murdered Breton. First memory brought forth the Babi Yar. From those ravines, I seek the answers even now. My phantom burns from bullet holes, don't get me very far. The pain excruciating as I bow. Our genetic burden overall is of the sort one wouldn't wish as wind and willows. Don't even notice petty theft at all as our thoughts are on the march to sell us bills. Not much has changed, greater measures still, yet a brighter ray will always pierce the cloud cover. Who had forgiven, perpetrators, victims, will deadlock in rhetoric. There is nothing to discover. Yet we appeared, the odds were there to beat. Our core peculiar and verge of constant tearing. We won't give up the corner of our street, despite the attempts of present Goebbels, Hess, or Goering. We'll change the locale to California. The epigraph here comes from a legendary song in American rock and roll. John Fogerty wrote the lyrics um, and the epigraph is, have you ever seen the rain? I pondered the thought of about ever hearing the rain, just stop and sort of hear it. It's called Hearing Rain in September. How long has it been since you heard the rain? You're aware that particularly in September, the rain wheels neither soar nor the fragrance of the sky. It does rustle the leaves in the doomed foliage though, striving so hard not to appear prophetic. While being an unwitting forerunner of the snow, that night rain in September had the certain rhetorically tart clarity, like the wine, which is not in the bottles just yet, Fermentation still being a process. So most likely there's still Napa grapes in those valleys than the favorite drink of the idol. You are probably hearing through sleep such a tender and quivering whisper, which is sketching in autumn, 
so gently inside Destiny's horoscopes notebooks. When you wake in the morning, believe it. Doubt serve no particular purpose. You'll be much better off trusting the whispers of that rain in September by far. Uh, my last poem in the segment uh, means the world to me, just like the woman who it's uh, dedicated to. 15 years today, my wife Anya and me, we got married in Florida. Um, on the ocean, I remember that day vividly. It was warm in the morning and then the wind changed and it wasn't so warm anymore, but her warmth and just the specialty of that particular evening can believe it was 15 years ago on this day in January. To Anya. When ease of comfort unexpectedly descends to cups of tea, having abandoned walls and ceiling, an evening lie like dispenses fragrant flavors. When sudden suddenness finds refuge in Chopin. Not randomly, not randomly Chopin his interjections. To be particular as one should try in May, it is the dusk or twilight which become coincidences, silent yet so bright. It's the occurrence of non-rhyming lines. Such a catharsis notwithstanding answers and subtle words without the slightest chance during the time of drizzle and the wind when spring was so shy and slightly trembling, then comes the evening in mid-May. From inconspicuous collisions, fate defined, stating so graciously and softly, this is love. Thank you so much. Stella, uh, yeah. Stella will introduce uh, this section. Actually, I'll say a word. This wasn't a little planned. Um, this is a very special part of a very special reading. Both Stella and Gary are obviously fluent in Russian and um, from the same part of the world, but they met here in their youth. And there were many um, epic-like meetings and passages of years and other meanings. The, um, this is a really special moment in, um, in their lives, their first joint readings of their uh, books. And this part of the, um, this part of the uh, reading will be uh, uh, their pairing. So we'll be reading uh, in English. Gary will read a translation of uh, Stella's poem in English. Then Stella will read a poem of Gary's in English, and Gary will read a Russian corresponding poem. Go, please. Thanks. Thank you, Mad. Gary, that was beautiful. Your reading of your poems were really just striking and stunning. Thank you so much for reading them to us. Um, not only is Gary an amazing poet in both Russian and English, he's also a very, very fine translator into both languages. And he, he, amazingly said that he would he wanted to translate a few of my poems. I think he, she's translated so far about eight. And um, he, this is one short one that he translated into Russian. And I'm going to read it. It's called L.A. Empty. So I spent um, close to 20 years in L.A. I went to college at USC. And this, this, this poem I wrote about six years ago when I was visiting my mother. L.A. Empty. I can count on my L.A. to empty me out of dreams, the mind it burns with its sunny sun that's lit up like a sun lamp and my face cast a shadow I cannot outrun. The city's diminishing smog lifts up the horizon like, like a collapsing vertebrae and drives it into the ocean. And now Garik will read his Russian rendition. You guys will hear the music of Russian. It's quite beautiful. Garik, un unmute. <laughs> Thank you, my dear friend, for the privilege of sharing the 
virtual proverbial stage with you. It really is an honor. Um, as far as uh, I, I will briefly address what Matt kindly said. Yes, we are both fluent in Russian. And uh, even though, well, I'll speak for myself. I really have no connection to that language as such um, because I was born in Ukraine, a Jew who's been living in America for pretty much more than 40 years right now. So I try to find those answers, why Russian and all that, it's of course, those answers are geopolitical, we won't get into it, but Eric Maria remark, who in no, by no means am I attempting to even come closer to, but he said that of German language. He said, that's the first language, that's the language by faith that I was born with. And um, I also believe that the country, a certain particular country does not have uh, a claim to a language like English language belongs to world literature of so many literatures, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, India, Australia. Having said that, uh, I love translating into Russian and I love the language. Uh, as far as Stella saying about the music, the music is always in the original. What the translator's job is, is try and match it as close as possible uh, and, and try not to make it worse. Um, Stella read uh, another poem earlier today, Closer to Rome, which I also had the privilege of translating. I, I, I love that poem. I love Stella's mom, my best to Bella. Um, <laughs> and I love that, that poem because it was a catharsis experience in the way we all lived in those seaside suburbs of Rome uh, on the way here as kids. Um, and we didn't know what, what was awaiting us. I have a whole bunch of poems dedicated to La Dispoli. And, um, but this particular is LA, which in Russian, I have I had to spell out because LA is a proverbial, you know, sort of LA, but it is Los Angeles. You have to spell it out in Russian sometimes. So here goes in Russian. Los Angeles Apustiavshi. Я полагаюсь на свой Лос-Анджелес, исполнить опустошение моих мечтательных снов. Он выжигает разум своим солнечным солнцем, которое вспыхивает, как солнечная лампа, бросая тень на мое лицо, которую я не могу обогнать. Редеющий смог города приподнимает горизонт, как разрушаемый позвоночник, и гонит его в открытый океан. Thank you for a privilege uh, of translating this awesome poem. So, appreciate it. Gorgeous, gorgeous. So he made the, the work better. He made the poem better. That's that's the the privilege of, of a translator. You you can you can sort of correct, fix things. <laughs> It sounds so good in Russian. It's great. The musicality of Russian is wonderful. You don't have to really understand. It's not necessary to understand the language. Just you know what? We're gonna make music. you. We're gonna make you read this in Russian next time, if we ever show up in New Hampshire again. You owe it to us all to read it in Russian. How about that? Have you ever made me do anything, <laughs> or anyone has? No, no, that's not possible. But I will. I will. If you if you beseech me. No, I'm kidding. Sure, I'll read it in Russian because it's so beautiful, and I'll try not to make any mistakes. Um, well, great. Um, so now, um, now uh, Gary, Gary will read. So sorry, I call Garik. So that's like a sort of shorthand for Gary, but the Russian is Garik. So I can't. I've known Garik since I was fourteen. I can't call him Gary. It's too grandiose. Anyway. So you, so just if you're wondering like why there are two names that I'm addressing him as, okay. So the next poem that I, I will be reading, got, got Gary's a poem called Snow, Snow Days in Queens from his book. Again, that's his book. This lovely book called Confluences. Jenny, I like your glass of wine. Mine is waiting for me after this reading. <laughs> um, it is called, again, Snow Days in Queens. Page 84. 
snow days in Queens, Long Island in a heavy snowstorm, all flights at LGA have fallen victim to cancellations. In a row, second day, the parallel of unrelenting blizzard, diagonally also quite merciless, these days in Queens, the chain is subtly French. Four stars, that's all in the remaining inventory. Online hotels are hopelessly sold out. The snow always had its claim to fate. The city does not rhyme with it at all. That ocean feeling in between the rivers, so different from the city on the lake. There are always that 1984, it snowed after New Year's pretty wildly. Too much in common at 18 is never good. Such reminiscences are rare, must be the snow. Neither O'Hare nor Midway are accepting incoming flights. The blizzards moving there. Snow is perhaps the only common nuisance that is unknowingly and nonchalantly shared. And now uh, Gary will read selections or an adaptation of this poem in Russian. Because one never translates one own one own's work. Because this this poem was um, this poem was uh, written in in the in originally in English. So you adapted it, and got, Gary will read that selection, right? Am I correct? Um, or I was um, it yeah. So um, I was at the poetry reading in in New York uh, in nineteen. I'm sorry, not in nineteen and twenty fifteen, um, and. Uh, the snowstorm came in and it just shut everything down. It shut down all the New York airports. And then once it passed uh, the Northeast, it, it moved into Midwest. And so I couldn't get to Chicago for like three days. So I stayed in the hotel in Queens and uh, I wrote both versions, uh, first in English, then in Russian. Then Russian was the only one that I read for a while in my readings in Kiev and, you know, in, in Europe. And then um, the English version sort of became dominant. I almost don't want to read the Russian one, honestly. Uh, but we, um, we talked about some selections. So I'm going to read a few lines. Uh, I'm not proud of that poem in Russian, to tell you honestly. It's not kind. At mena reysa Queens i Snigapad. Nomer v New York's Kamateli, kod Leningrada na dveri. Рейсы с начала недели жертвами пали. Метели не только по всей параллели, но даже по диагонали. Порой не рифмуется город, что этот пафосно гордый, что тут тот этюдно аккордный, что здесь снегопад не вылет, что там ранение на вылет. И здесь, в занесенном отеле, где время осталось у двери, не вылеты осточертели, общие темы истлели. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful music. It's gorgeous. It's perfect. Thanks. So what do we do next? Matt, what do we do next? Well, we're going to do a check. I don't see. Um, maybe you do. Um, Katrina. Katrina is there. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, we're actually uh, running up. Uh, that went well, very well. Katrina, do you see any uh, significant questions except for a lot of greetings and, and presence? <laughs> on, I don't see any. But... No, big, no big questions yet, but folks, if you do have any questions or anything you'd like to say to either of the poets or to Matt, please just use the chat feature button is down at the bottom of the screen. Um, Matt, I'm going to let you take it over time being. Okay. Um, so in consideration of everything. Give it yeah. Minutes? Sure, sure. Um, how many did you say? Another 15, maybe 20 talks. Okay. Perfect. Well, we can do that. We can do that. Um, I'll start out, uh, since we've been deep into the poetry, I'll start out with a, and we've covered some of the things we'd plan to discuss anyway. Um, so here we just talked with both, um, both of you, Gary and Stella, about the language. And I'd like to launch from there. Um, uh, so let's start with Gary. A, um, 
some poetic truth, hypothetically, some poetic truth appears wherever poetic truths are. And the languages you speak and write in are competing for it. How do you know if the poetic truth is, which language is gonna win? Will it be Russian? Will it be English? Um, that's the kind of question. And um, a related thing for Stella, who I, you don't write in Russian, correct? Though you're fluent, oh. obviously. And um, is that, um, anyway, I, uh, the same kind of question, how do you know that a poetic truth comes and you decide to, you go always with English, this kind of thing. Uh, and do you hear it when you write your English? Do you hear it also in Russian? Anyway, two different types of questions focused on, um, Gary, why don't you start? Um, thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to use this opportunity to say that um, Matt Salomon is an amazing poet. Uh, I've been translating him. I had the privilege of doing that as well, and I'll be translating him more. Um, I have no, not enough words of gratitude to Nina Kosman, who once uh, invited us all to a particular reading poetry and translation, and there I heard Matt. Uh, just by miracle, that particular morning, I was uh, looking for a translation of a Hebrew poet, uh, and it took me to a website, <laughs> which ended up being um, Matt Solomon's, and I met him that afternoon. So things like that, when it's connected to poetry, it, it, they happen. Uh, when we realize that poetry is really education, uh, which we are only given a slight chance to sit down or not even sitting down, uh, try to jot it down, to record it or not, or, and miss the opportunity for that poem to exist. Um, it doesn't really matter which language it comes into, I guess. Uh, it's subliminal. Uh, I sincerely believe that the true poetic sense, like you said, hopefully I haven't written yet. And I hope that I will write it in one of the two languages that I dream to write in, which is Hebrew, uh, which means the world to me because of my heritage and Ukrainian, which I'm only being translated to by my good friends in Kiev, but I hope uh, that country means a lot to me. I hope to be able to write in Ukrainian one day. Maybe those are the two languages that I will write that poem, that cover the poem that all of us are sort of striving to hear from the dictation that comes from above anyway. I hope that was not a pompous answer. No, not at all. And uh, Stella, if you're there, maybe she's not there, she's away. Um, we can return to that. Um, yeah, Stella, yeah. Back. hey, um, so um, is there anything to add on that in terms of, uh, I wonder sometimes how, because Russian was your first language and you were active and a, and a, and a fantastic poet in English, do you, is there a resonance from what you come up with in English back to Russian, or is it simply not? Um, it's simply not. It's uh, it's uh, it's sort of Russian is uh, is a passive language. It's it's my it's native, but I wasn't formally educated in it. So I mean, but you you can't escape the nativeness of it, and I don't want to. Um, um, but I simply can I cannot. I, I hear the music, but I can't. I can't write in it. I can't create in it. I can see it. I can translate from it, um, and I can hear it in in other people's work. And I I'm fluent, and I read it. <laughs> I know, and I read it and write it. It's just something. It's not an active language. It's just because I live here. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's it's. When when uh, Gary translated a lot of the, the poems, it, it it was very it was very moving um, and and kind of heartbreaking for me to hear myself in my native language. And I be and I also what was sad is that I couldn't do that myself. But it felt very close. He came very close to writing it as if I wrote it. And um. I'm forever grateful to him for that. And so are we.
Um, so I'm going to check the chat line. How are we doing, Katrina? Um, I see one. Here's a good uh, one. I, I will um, uh, encourage from Genia Klein. I hope I pronounce your name properly. Who writes, um, I think that poetic truth is two different things in Russian and English. I think we should say poetic truths. The meanings are different, don't you think? That's a good question. I'm going to hand it off to uh, you and to um, Gary. Are there different? Are there different poetic truths that are essentially tied to different languages, as opposed to things that languages attach themselves to? Who do you want to answer first? Uh, you, Worslava. Hi, please. Um, hi, Zhenya. Thank you so much for putting us on the spot that way. We disconnected uh, our videos. I'm sorry. May I Jenny Crane is an amazing writer from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and uh, her her novel on uh, Frost uh, has been really making my quarantine sort of uh, sheltering in place much more pleasant than it would have been otherwise. Um, she was born in St. Petersburg, hence the, the tone of the question. I don't know, Jenny. That's what Socrates said. Uh, and I'm, I don't mean to, to quote him like this, but I, I don't want to say something superficial. Uh, it's an amazing question. I promise you that in the course of this 2021, I will answer it to you, hopefully in person in Boston, when your husband and you and I are drinking wine one day. Wine one day. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you again, Zhenya, who uh, I guess we've got the videos disconnected at this point, um, but I'll read uh, what Zhenya wrote. And also I apologize for mispronouncing your name in a German way, it's Klein. The, um, she uh, comments, there are refer these are, there are referential pools of potential truths, I guess, that are not only linguistic, but cultural, for bilingual poets. That's an amazing uh, thought there. Um, thank you for uh, contributing that. Um, do we have messages from others? Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Well, they kind of go together. Um, what moves you personally as, as an artist, as a poet the most? Nature, family, circumstances in society or something else? And that question is from Francine. I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I often call myself, or I'm engaged in the um, urban pastoral. So um, I walk my dog around, um, my husband walks her in the morning and I walk her at night. And so she and I always see something very new. And I feel like I'm always in encountering something in an urban landscape. Um, but nature is very important to me and also interiority and family. Um, you write about the people who are very close to you. Um, that's sort of like the old writerly adage, but then you take some of those, some of their lovely characteristics and then somehow you distort them. So it's not really about them. You're really, they're just uh, conduits to your own, to your own aesthetics or vision. Gary, Gary, what do you think? What, what are, I'll try to be brief, even though that's not my nature. Um, you, I don't think we ever, you and I ever since the early 80s or ever up until now, we never talked about the urban pastoral, but you just pierced me actually, because uh, this is how, how my poetry has been defined. And I have that uh, line in my poem dedicated to Canadian cinema in Montreal, urban pastoral. You wanted us to write a book together one day, Stella? You just, you, just, you just came up with the title, okay? I love it. That's what it will be. Um, you know, uh, I will try to answer that question. Sometimes um, the objects of poems uh, are people who don't really want to be in those poems. Um, and uh, I apologize for the past, present, and the future if that happens. Um, 
I think it's pretty much everything. It's a confluence of things. Uh, the people, what's happening. I think we're living in a very historical time just this week or, or last week. Um, so uh, as long as the dictation continues, we'll continue to jot it down about whatever comes from above. And when you say dictation, you mean the muse? Again, we can so, define- so We need to clarify to, to those people who have no idea what you're talking about. Well, it's not a dictation from, from somebody crazy or whatever, it's the muse. You're very, it's, and which is a very, very kind of like European notion, the, and you know, the muse dictating, because we feel like we're receiving something. It doesn't really belong to us because it's so powerful. Well, uh, the muse in Russian has a particular connotation and I have a feeling that a few objects who were those probably would not uh, be kindly accepting my talking about muses as such. Um, I believe that we don't come up with everything in the poem. I believe that it's out there. Um, I mean, we can call it God, we could call it, but I do hear that sometimes. And being a lawyer, sometimes I don't have time to jot it down. I mean, sometimes lines come and go and, and I can't forgive myself for not doing it. Um, so we'll, we'll define it in the future books though. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I have a couple of more questions. Um, the first is from Max and he asks, is authenticity a concern to, to both of you when you're writing? Um, and if so, what kind of authenticity? Authenticity to, to yourself, to your spirit, to that creative drive, or authenticity to, to the reality of what you're writing about? Um, let me go first. Uh, wow, this is such a fascinating question. Authenticity. Well, you know, poetry is actually not a memoir. If you go to any library, it's it's uh, classified in the nonfiction section, which was a huge surprise to me. Um, poetry is fiction. We write it. There are personas. You know, uh, it's often you know you have a you have a character. You you take a form of a character. Or you or you are you personify something or. But it's it's never it's pieces of yourself, but it's really not always yourself. Although I feel like I'm writing from my as as myself, but again we have personas, I, I believe, and authenticity, authenticity is, is something that's fluid, I believe. Um, authenticity. That's a very interesting question. I will have to ponder on that. But if I had to give the answer right now. In Russian, uh, there is this continuing debate and dilemma, even in the, in the Russian speaking communities uh, in Israel and in the United States and Canada, or you know, the metropolitan areas such as Ukraine and Russia itself. Uh, and they define it, at least how I hear it, and Zhenya can correct me if I'm not stating it right. Uh, there is this discussion about poetry and graphomania or attempt to write poetry. So I assume if it's authentic, it's in the eye of a beholder, it's in the eye of a reader. So if it's authentic, that's poetry. If it's not, then it's graphomania. I hope I answered that. How do you define graphomania? What is that? Well, you, we will open such a Pandora's box. Define it because I can, can I say something? Can I chip in? Since you can't see me, I, I do speak English. Sorry, uh, uh, it's graphomaniac, which is a French word. We need someone who is obsessed with writing, meaning you just uh, write some. I don't know. There is a word for it. It's a it's a street word. I'm not sure I remember it right now. But Russian people, everybody writes there. And Russian crowd is extremely unpleasant when you share your pieces. I chose to transfer into English and transition into English partially because of that. 
because I felt so very welcomed and so very warm and fuzzy when I spend time with people who write in English. And when I'm in a Russian crowd, it's just very unwelcoming. Um, and particularly not from the readers, by the mm -hmm. way, but from the people who write. I hope I did answer your question. I wish I can come back with my glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Welcome. But it's a very interesting question. I'll have to think about it a little bit. I, I, my, I, I think my answer is incomplete, but that's, that's my pondering on authenticity. Thank you for asking. Deborah asks, would any of the poets, I, I believe this includes you, Matt, uh, all polymaths, uh, speaking multiple language, uh, care to speak about translation, especially of poetry as an echo chamber, i.e. how various languages inform the act of translation. Do some languages filter for you, echo more loudly, prevail in the way cultures associated with them do? Very thoughtful tonight, guys. I love this. Yeah, Gary, Gary and Stelly want to start for this. <laughs> I'm constantly on the spot. Um, yeah, well, you're getting all, you're getting the big bucks for this, Gary. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> huge. Uh, I think actually, Matt, you are probably the most qualified to answer that. Mine would only be sort of pondering. I can only translate from the languages that I understand. And there are basically three and a quarter languages that I understand. Uh, I fluently understand English in all its connotations, I guess, British, Canadian, American, New Zealand. Uh, I understand Russian, even though some of the things that come out of Russia proper right now, I have to stop myself and wonder, did, what do they mean? I understand Ukrainian. Uh, in fact, I understand it more now than when I was born there, because that was the language that was, you know, Kiev is a bilingual city, always has been, most, much like Montreal. Uh, everybody in Kiev uh, understands both Russian and Ukrainian can switch from one to another, at least in the understanding. Um, but I came to appreciate uh, the beauty and, and music of Ukrainian uh, already while being here in the States and, and, and traveling. I, I go to Kiev often enough. I, I cannot imagine not going there often. Um, I also understand a fraction of Yiddish because that's literally the first language I grew up with. My grandparents, I spent the first seven years of my life in their apartment and they spoke that amazing language, which unfortunately I didn't pick up all <laughs> at all. Well very slightly, uh, but then later on, um, I, I, I'm trying to teach myself uh, that language a little bit, uh, hopefully one day, that and Hebrew, but I can only translate from uh, English, Russian and Ukrainian right now, so. And a, and a fine job you too. Stella, you. do you want to weigh in? Uh, sure, I mean, I. I, I'm, I'm just sort of, my, my, the way I, I look at translation is a little bit different than, than staying uh, close to, to the original. I, I prefer to see um, adaptations because I think poetry is, is untranslatable. I mean, it's not, I'm not the only one who says this, you know, po it's, just, it's, it's just so difficult to do. Um, and each translator brings her own, her own, um, uh, footprint or, or thumbprint. It's really the voice of the translator um, if, it, if it works. So I prefer to, to create adaptations. And so to, it, would, it would not be, so these adaptations are not faithful to the work, to the original. Um, Nabokov actually sort of, sort of created this notion that he did not that you can't translate it. He, he translated Eugene Onegin, uh, Pushkin's Eugene Onegin, into English, and it it was like a, it's like a four volume work. The tread there's a, there are notes and glossaries and it's like scholarship, and he was received um, by the critics at the time as someone who botched up, botched the whole thing up, 
and it was like a whole, he was like, Nabokov was really clever and, and doing all these tricky things and playing tricks on people. So he played a trick on the critics. Um, he demonstrated that poetry cannot be translated. But, it, but he could have beautifully translated it, translated the line, the idiom, uh, he got it. He, he could have done the Anegin uh, stanza, the sonnet, he could, he could have done it, but he made a specific point that it's not translatable. But having said all that, I'm glad that the translations exist because I love reading uh, poetry and translation. Um, um, and one last question. This one is from Sergey. Uh, is your inspiration driven by lived experience or keen observation? Well, mine is the confluence of both. And that's the shortest answer I can probably gather today, tonight. Both, definitely both. But thanks for asking. <laughs> And, and for me as well, and I'm going to answer, if I remember this uh, line from a poem called Poetry by Marianne Moore, she says, make, um, in real something, I'm going to mess it up, make real gardens, no, in imaginary gardens, make real toads, something like that. Does anybody remember? That? So anyway, the idea is that you, you're, you, you use your imagination, but you sort of make everything real in it. Paraphrasing. Yeah, I remember the beginning of the poem and the paraphrased ending. Um, I too don't like a, all that fiddle, right? That one. Right, right. Uh, well, we'll find it for next time. Um, so um, I think we're okay. This uh, It's very good to leave the conversation alive and walk away. We're going to, we're going to, um, you know, alive, still burning till we get back. Uh, we want to move toward the um, finale in which we exit the reading as we came in with the poems. Um, so before uh, we do that, we want to thank everyone, the participants, um, Katrina and Toadstool, and everyone involved with this, principally to the poets and the muses and the poetic truths wherever they lie. Thank you all. Stella will uh, read her farewell for the evening poem and Gary will follow. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt, for being our, our wonderful interlocutor. This poem is called The Apartment of Russian, Russian Hill and it takes place in, in a neighborhood in San Francisco. The floor to ceiling window peeled open a city in disquiet on the Pacific Rim. By day a tulip, by night a monster. It hung over Russian Hill like a light bulb. It accepted the visitors like an elevator car. A large table in the dining room mapped out someone's unhappy life, sitting in the wind. We drank and ate in the hill in the disquiet of hunger and thirst. We were framed by love. At night, a bed branded us in hieroglyphics. We parsed the rings of unhappiness in our skins, like animals in the wild. The lemon tree with large fruit stood guard. Each morning, the apartment woke up to primary colors, the sunlight beheld in the tulip. You lay on the threshold in conversation with monsters. The tulip fell dark, the cable car on the hill punched down the street with rehearsed confidence. It makes a full stop for me. I survey passengers engaged in modern life, entangled in cords, listening to the passage of time, as I fall silent for now, hopping off for now, walking up the hill. I would like to um, sort of go out on the limb because we are almost out of time. First of all, thank you everybody. Thank you so much for, for being and sharing this New England, Midwestern, New York and um, Washingtonian evening with us. Um, I would like to offer and almost insist on giving my place for reading a last poem to Matthew Solomon. I would like to ask him to read one of his poems. He's an amazing poet. 
and uh, this particular reading would not happen if he didn't shepherd us um, and helped us out a lot. So the the very <laughs> the very minimal thing we can we can do is gratitude. I believe is to ask him to read something of his own. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, Matt. That one. Oh, really? Uh, no, I'm not on the spot. No. So I'll read a poem which I didn't write, but I feel is my own. It's written by Gary Light, and it's called <laughs> An Epiphany. <laughs> Let's just get there again to that unforgettable place where the rain as it falls whispers names on the cobblestone surface. Let's just get there whenever, be it spring as the lilacs make it insane or the fall when the leaves as they perish do it through all the magic of seeing. Let's just get there again, just to marvel and witness all those images that are impossible to be described. Let's not bring anything. Let those matters remain somewhere else. All the pain and forebodings, betrayals and merciless doubts will be all written off as superfluous things of the past. As we are taken in by this island of hope in the midst of the city, as we walk, we'll encounter those transient remnants of childhood dreams, which may not be interpreted logically followed or witnessed and conquered. We would suddenly out of nowhere wholeheartedly start to believe in the way which some cynics will never succeed in convincing us to reconsider. We'll just wander here all afternoon as the twilight takes over the river, as the synagogues, churches and mosques cast reflections of light through the shadows, permeating epiphany, simple and true as the air and the words that are better unspoken. Let's just get there again to enable that flow of events, which were always foretold, but so rarely happen in times when the miracles are ridiculed by the soulless and clever. Yet those latter will lose just as long as we get there on time. Let's just get there again. Thank you. Matt, thank oh, you so much. Amazing I, reading. Wow, I love I, it. Uh, thank you. Matt, you know, this poem, uh, this poem is uh, dedicated to my mom. So perhaps when she hears it in such an amazing delivery, uh, it would mean a lot to her. I hope so. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I will put you on the spot next time for sure. You are reading your poetry. You are a poet with a capital B. Thank you so much. For <laughs> okay. Thank you. See you guys. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks for thank hosting you. us. And thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Lovely to see you, Gary. Oh, hey, Moala. Well, you guys, everyone, buy Gotti's book. Buy Stella's. Yes. Well book. done, no, Gotti's well book. Well done, right Gary. I haven't seen it since he was 16. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's your birthday beautiful. party, Gary. Well, well, that's right. Wait, wait, hang on. We the, the, that crazy birthday. It was my birthday, right? Sixteen. It was sweet my sweet sixteen. sixteen. God, it was there, and like a, a lot of my friends. That's and, right. It's amazing and, that you guys and have you portrait. showed with Bill, and you were like, we're like, oh my God, is this really this? This could be us one day. Like you guys were like our gods. <laughs> that's part of God. That's part of God. Good I remember. God, God is going to sleep. <laughs> goddess goddess to Allah bye bye it was guys well done thank you so much thank you thank you nice thank you so much how do they how do they